Welcome back to another episode of the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, a platform created to entertain, educate, and grow the game of tennis at all levels. My friends call me Ship, but this show isn't about me. We will be bringing you interviews with coaches, community leaders, and players, along with updates about tennis happening around the world. Tennis is a culture, and we are all writing tennis history together. Today, I am here with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Nate Walrit. For those of you who uh, who pay attention to tennis, especially on social media, uh, you may be familiar with Nate and his work. Uh, Nate works for Tennis Point, but uh, there there's more to him there uh, as far as the tennis knowledge than maybe meets the eye. Nate uh, not only does a little commentary and, and brings media both through visual and, and what he's doing with Tennis Point, but also through his podcast, uh, the Pure Tennis Podcast. And additionally, uh, Nate coaches, and he and he played for for Bellarmine University um, uh, as someone who played at a I don't want to say small school, but a smaller school uh, myself. Uh, I, I just think you know I'm sure Nate would agree. It's great to advocate for all levels of college tennis. It's a wonderful thing. I, I'm being too long-winded. What I need to say is, Nate, welcome to the pod. I appreciate it, my man. That's a quite the introduction. Super excited to be on the show. Uh, I know you and I have gone back and forth uh, the past few months now. I just share the love of the game um, in all aspects, whether it's marketing, watching the pro circuit, watching college tennis, the junior market. So. Fun to always connect with another tennis head in the uh, in the ethosphere, and uh, I hope to be on the show, man. Appreciate it. I think that passionate people speak the same language, and uh, whenever you you talk about tennis, it's very clear that you're passionate about the game. You're passionate about the growth of get growth of the game, the direction you'd like to see, and obviously, you're a huge advocate of not just junior tennis but college tennis at all levels. When you love the game, you just love it. Um, if you could, maybe, sure. I, I know you sometimes post about some of your coaching and, and some of the young people you get to work with. Um, could you maybe, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your coaching philosophy or, or maybe some things that when it comes to junior players that you, as someone who, you know, has worked with some different ages of juniors, what, what is, what is your big focus whenever you're working with players? What do, what do you feel like is really important for junior tennis players to be focused on? It's a great question. Um, I've coached tennis since I was in high school uh, during the summers. Um, and I was able to kind of, I feel like I was able to learn and just as much as I was able to hopefully teach just from learning from these players. And I've learned that for me, like to be a good coach that these players want to come work hard for and, really kind of trust and listen to is having fun is like the number one thing for me is like, I got to make sure that like I'm bringing the energy every day. I'm going out there um, that the player feels my energy, that it's um, just a positive um, atmosphere. And I like to create that energy, whether it's, I'm just a loud person in general, especially when it comes on to being on the tennis court, I'll have music going at clinic. When we do clinics, I've always been an advocate for music and stuff. And um, once I get the energy right in the room, I feel like I can be someone that can tune in and lock down the details on on these kids and I've always taken the approach to just like um I mean obviously like you can only tell a player so much in per each practice but we try to just knock out like I, I'm, I'm really big on going all in on one small detail for like a week or so and that's what I've worked with I got a young kid Benny Patton his dad Joe Patton is the producer of the Pure Tennis podcast who's a kid that I've been able to like he's been the first guy that I've been with since he was like five or six and that's been a whole different experience for me to take a kid from literally um, the ground up where a guy had been a hockey player and uh, when he was like five or six and finally came to tennis. And it's it's been a lot of fun just to develop his strokes from the ground up. And um, he just has a passion for the game that makes, like you said, we speak the same language. And I think that's the coolest thing is when you find those players that you connect with and my goal is to connect with all of them at some capacity and uh, you can just, you start speaking the same language and that's when coaching becomes one of the most rewarding things that I do in my life and I wish I could do it more, but uh, I love doing it when I'm out there. I may be a little biased, but what I hear when you speak coming through that passion is you're someone that understands that at the end of the day, tennis is supposed to be fun. Gotta be and, fun. And when you're on the court, I know that your players, they can feel your energy. Uh, you're getting them hyped. Like you said, you're loud, but it's supposed to be fun and you're, and you're having fun. Um, 
we're good. dancing. I'm yelling. It's a, it's, it's a crazy atmosphere. You know, like the parents always tell me like, they can tell that I'm coaching before they can see me, you know, they can, they hear me before they see me. And I'm like, that's, I, I, I gotta be like, you know, someone's gotta be that guy. And uh, it's funny. Cause when I was at, when I was a kid, I was in clinics. I wasn't like, I don't know. It's just like, but when you're coaching, like you got to make them feel you. And that's what I always tell them. Like, I got to, I gotta tell the other coaches, like, you got to make them feel you. Like you got to make sure that the energy is up and you got to bring that form because these kids are, they're coming after long days of school or whatever it is too. And so just to give them that juice and well, I, yeah, I got to make sure that, that everybody's having a good time. And if, cause I always tell kids like the, the day and the moment you stop having fun with this sport is the day and the moment you stop getting better. It's like, it's impossible to get better at really probably anything in life. If you're not, having some fun with it you know if it, when it becomes a drag you stop working and putting that the work in and caring about the details i know personally that if i lived close to you uh and i had kids that age you are the type of coach that i would be seeking out personally because i'm a big believer that that fun aspect is so underrated what do you think that uh parents that's, of appreciate young that, players that's, that's, <laughs> Uh, what do you think par parents of young players should be looking for in a coach? What makes a good coach and what should parents be looking for? Just to have like someone that cares. That's that's the main thing is like, like the guy doesn't have to be the most perfect diagnosis of, of your swing or like, and like be the best analyst of your game or strategically like always on point. But if he just cares about your kid and cares about your kid getting better, there's so many resources out there that that kids nowadays have at the, at their fingertips um, but if the, if the coach is looking out for him and, and putting work in with him, I mean, I think like, it's, I think it's hard to be a good tennis coach. I mean, it's hard to be a, co a good coach of anything. So if the, if the coach cares and he's is, is willing to put the work in and give your kid the attention that he, that he needs, then I think that's where you got to start. And that's, that comes before anything else. I think too many times I see parents sign off on a coach that just cause he had a track record of coaching X amount of players that did something and he doesn't even care about that kid. He just, He's like, and that's not to hate on coaches, but it goes both ways. Some kids aren't putting work, but it's like, that's just one thing that like, you got to have a coach that is giving your kid the love and the attention that he needs. And then from there on out, like it can be a budding relationship where the, and the coach, when he, if he cares, he's going to, he's going to find a way to make the kid better. It's just like, and it's, yeah, like I said, there's other ways to, to, to listen and tune in and you can watch tennis just like we all do. And there's so many cool things on social media now with tips and workouts that work that kind of progress your game and, um, yeah, but I'd say look for a coach that genuinely wants to put the time in and give your kid that attention. I think it's kind of, it goes without saying, but when you spend so much time coaching, uh, a young person in a sport that's so individual, this, this bond, if, if the coach is invested, this bond is formed, it's those people become your family. And, and like you're saying, yeah. if, if the passion is there and they care about your kid, even if they're not a perfect coach, they don't have that, you know, that resume, whatever it might be, they're going to, they're going to seek out that information necessary sure. to help your player get better. So uh, communication is key, but obviously that relationship, like you're saying, I feel like is super key. What is, what's a piece of advice you feel like every junior tennis player needs? No, one of my best friends still to this day is my former coach from all through my junior high school career. So it's just like, like you said, that bond that is formed, it's yeah, it's it's for life. But um, what is a piece piece of advice I'd give to juniors? You asked. Yeah, I'd say, oh man, that's like, what if I have one piece of advice to them? Um, like one thing I always like to test in the beginning of practices is like, what kind of stick skills the kids have? Like you know, like if that tells me if the kid loves it. So like I always like one thing I always say is like fall in love with your like your racket and your equipment because like if you learn the stick skills and stuff it just helps your coordination, your athleticism. I know you and I share drills and stuff on social. Um, but like, you can tell like, the kids that are, that can catch the ball at the racket and stuff like that. It's like, make your racket like one of your best friends and like whatever, like hitting against the wall, like in the kids that it's hard to teach passion, but that's why you, it's all about making things fun. Cause so that passion grows. And I think, like I said, I tell all these kids, like if you're not having fun and you make like these tournaments feel like a drag traveling around, like, and you put so much pressure on yourself, like, it's going to be hard to to kind of release yourself and kind of reach your potential. So um, I always tell, like, like I said, we're here to have fun, number one. And then after that, like, we'll, we're working hard. Like, we'll put the work in to, to get better every day. But um, I know it's not the uh, craziest piece of advice, but I mean, I, I start from there with almost, even when I used to coach the adults, I'm like, we're here to have fun. That's from, that's, I tell almost everybody from, from the, the juniors to the adults.
that's why pickleball, I, I think that's the main thing is with pickleball is like those people, tennis people, we like to kind of, we, we don't like to, but it's like, they're having fun. And that's, that's what it's all about. That's why they get the participation numbers that they get. Yeah, a hundred percent. That's, that's definitely why the participation is up. They, we know that those people are having fun and they're being loud and having a good time. Uh, we got to match that energy. That's what we got to do. I like the challenge. We gotta, we... I've got a lot of energy. I, I get it. I'm not struggling with matching anybody's energy. I know you're not. Either. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say, Nate, let's say that a, a player comes to you and we would already consider them a good player. They're at least at least an intermediate level player. Maybe they have a goal of, you know, at least playing some low level college tennis. When you first get the chance to assess them, you're like, okay, forehand's pretty good, backhand's pretty good, they can volley. Like fundamentally, you know, they've got a decent, decent serve, decent return. Like nothing is glaringly standing out because I think it's common sense of like if you have a weakness, you gotta at least have all the shots before you can kind of you know, focus on something else. If someone comes to you and they're good and they want to go from good to great or great to excellent or excellent to elite, so just something that they could do, what is that level raiser? You know, do you have a drill that you're like, hey, if you're trying to take your next level, it's this or a habit or something that you would say, hey, if you're trying to find your next level, anybody could implement this. And if you dedicate yourself to this or if you work hard on this thing, I guarantee you'll get better. What would you say that thing is for you? I think it's what probably hindered me from reaching my max potential, which is full work. I think it's got to be the full work aspect of it. Um, and, and it's got to be like, like it's this is a lower body sport and the people that have the legs and put the weight, put the room in the, the way, put to work in the weight room and as all, and as well as develop their, just like their, there's so many little ladder drills and stuff that just to kind of keep your brain in that mindset of it constantly has to be moving the, the small jitter steps that get you just positioned right to be balanced on every shot. I think that's the one that is a differentiator, uh, especially when I watch these really good high school players to college players, it's like just, the, it's, it looked the, the ones that do it great are the ones that look so simple and effortless, but they're constantly maneuvering their body to get in position. Um, I think that is number one. And number two is just to string together some patterns, just like some to consi some consistent patterns where like when you get this ball, 85% of the time you're hitting the shot, like, and just like tricking your brain to, to just taking the thinking out of the tennis and just hitting the shot into a big sweet, into a big spot. I always say, say swing big, but swing big into a big target. And I think that's, when you're hitting those patterns and you take out the thinking of tennis um, to that extent, then once your confidence gets, gets rolling from there, you, you can, I think that's when these kids start to kind of let their wings, uh, wing, wings out and kind of fly a little bit. No, I like that answer. I think that that's, that's obviously really good advice with you being somebody that, that obviously played college tennis, you know, some of the people we've had here on the grassroots tennis pod, you know, they're playing at super large division one schools, but us being guys that maybe played at some, at some lower level, I don't want to call it low level because it is good tennis people. There's good tennis at every level, but I didn't watch division. I went to the Orlando for the division three uh, NCAA tournament. And I will say there's, good tennis players all over the place like there's guys mm -hmm. that have to, i mean case western versus tufts in the final i would say 12 for 12 are the guys in the singles lineup like are playing division one if they want to like all 12 of those right. guys could play somewhere in division one the top guy is going to go to obviously, obviously hopper is going to go play for virginia next year from case but all those guys could find some d1 school if they wanted to so the, yeah, sure. the level is there's good players i mean college tennis has never been deeper there's never been more talent i mean even to play at a school like Bellarmine right now, like if you want to play one or two, like you got to be a 12 plus UTR if you want to have a winning record. It's, it's incredible how many, like it blows my mind just seeing how the level has just continued to rise throughout. And there's just, doesn't matter where, like the most random schools now, like even when I was playing college, it's like Cumberland University, like they, they got players, Drury, like all these schools, Drury, like Drury, you in like, yeah, there's, there's talent everywhere. What would you say your college recruiting process is like? What was it like? Oh man, that's that was that's quite man. You're quite a bit ago. Let's. Talk, I mean, I was reaching out to coaches when I was young, probably sophomore year, uh, just to kind of get feelers out there. I ended up taking visits to uh, Butler, Xavier, visit NKU and, and Bellarmine. Those were kind of only four schools I looked at. Um, but really, I went down to visit Bellarmine, and it was like two years after they won the national championship in basketball, and. Uh, 
I remember just the feeling I got like everything, the, the athletics felt big there. It just felt like that was a, there was a big emphasis on that. And it was a small community, like good, like a small tight knit community that I was, I felt that, that was like, that was an attractive piece for me in a cool city like Louisville. So um, yeah, I mean, it was all about just getting the vibe like that I wanted to be around for the next four years, five years for me, I had to do a fifth year. Uh, one of that little victory lap, but it was more about um, just like feeling comfortable and being an hour and a half away, um, feeling like I was away from my family enough to kind of experience that college um, experience, but also being not too far away to have my family come down and watch matches and stuff. That was a big piece of it as well. But um, yeah, the guys on the team were a huge part of it. Like I was, some of my best friends were actually having a reunion here in a week. All the guys from all over the world are coming back in town to Louisville. So I wanted that part of it as well. And uh, right away, I connected with the guys, and it was like a family atmosphere that was just huge for me, just just to have that, and um, yeah, like lifelong friends that you meet. And I was being only the only American on my team was a cool experience for me, and hearing all these different languages and guys with different backgrounds than me, and trying to learn their culture. It was all of that kind of played into it. So college tennis is amazing. I just highly recommend it to anybody. That even um, if even if you have a chance, just play somewhere, give it a chance for a year. You can always transfer and live that college life that you want. But I think a lot of people will find that it's it's a unique experience. I love it. I love every moment of it. I will even say for those people that maybe aren't playing quite at a high enough level to play at the type of school that they want, to, to seek out those manager positions on those Division One squads, if you love the game and you enjoy it, even just being a part of a team in that capacity is such a really cool life experience. If you have an opportunity to plug into the game after high school, do it. And you don't have to be a complete product at 18. Just because you don't move on to play college tennis doesn't mean you still can't play leagues, can't play men's open and, or go tennis. play club tennis, yeah. man. That's what I was going to say. No, club tennis is crazy. Like I, I've got an appreciation for that. I've just watched UC club tennis team uh, has gotten us into some events that we ended up sponsoring. And I went to watch a lot of the top club teams play at the Western Southern um, up in Mason, Ohio this past summer. And there's there's like legit players out there. And I was like, that that kind of blew me away, both the men and women. And a lot of these kids love the, love the game. And they like they're going to be around the game for a long time. So I thought it was super cool. And I, it opened my eyes, that's for sure. We have some interviews lined up here at the Grassroots Tennis Pod uh, with a couple different people to come on and maybe give people a taste of talking about what that club tennis experience was like. And we're, we're kind of looking forward to that. I think that's something that people don't talk about enough as an opportunity to keep playing if you love the game, but maybe want to go to a different school than where, you know, these teams play. They get 30 people out every Wednesday night to practice. And on Sundays too, it's like, it's cr- like sometimes 40 plus. It's like the whole front section of these courts are, are filled with, six bodies per court kind of rotating in and out. And so it's and high energy practice. It's like a, their own cardio tennis drill. So it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I've, I've, I've ran in with those guys a few times and it's um, you can just see why those people love it and they, they stick it out. And they, a lot of them do like five years of it. I know that you're someone that follows the game juniors, you know, whether it's USTA juniors, you, you pay attention to ITFs, you're, you're paying attention to the college game, you're paying attention to different levels of the pro tour, the, the men's side, the women's side. I know you, you take in a lot of tennis. Uh, is there anything with the way junior tennis in the United States or college tennis or even the pro level, the way that it's currently run or structured that you would like to see change? It's a good question. I've just talked about this. Um, with my former coach, I mean, I always look at him as coach, but just I think us not developing our juniors on clay courts uh, hurts our point construction and just our shot tolerance uh, at the highest level. I think that's why you see our guys um, struggle, particularly on the clay. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is like on a fast, hard court, a lot of our guys are comfortable, but you get these these longer strung out points where it takes multiple points of attack to kind of really capitalize guys are getting more balls in play. Um, I think that's where we struggle. And I think that's where even at the junior level, it's like, uh, I think the, the shot selection could be improved if that was, um, if clay courts were a bigger part of our, just our, the, the U S tennis market. But I don't know if that's like a, I don't know why we don't red clay. I guess it's hard to come by, but it's like, even on the, in the summers, I don't feel like a lot of juniors train on the Tenneco or hard, whatever they call that surface, the green clay. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, I think that is, is, is a part of it. I think that would help. But, I mean, outside of that, I mean, I think there's just 
I would love for us to emulate what Europe does with like their more their club, um, and just like their the way they're kind of set up. I know it's it's a whole different just how our our country set up is just different, but like it just seems more convenient at some of these clubs. Like I was over in Europe visiting my my roommate this past winter, and it's just like it just seems like it's a little more convenient for them to get into their club tennis and clinics and programs than it is here. Uh, but that that's just a, something I, that's going to be a, more of a long term play. Um, but yeah, I think w what's your kind of take on that? Do you think it's, is it, do you think we need the more, more clay courts for these juniors? I absolutely do. And I think that the USTA has known that for a long time. And the fact that we put our focus and the money that they're taking in into different things than that doesn't really make sense to me. Not only is it about playing on clay, but it's about playing on slow clay. And it's about playing with the balls that these European countries are playing with. The ball is literally heavier. It is harder to hit winners. You have to learn how to actually construct points to have success. Your movement has to be elite to hang in points. Both of yep. those things would greatly improve the way our juniors develop. And I would love – the USTA got rid of their, uh, at least for juniors, if, I, if I'm right, uh, their membership fee for junior players. And it was only 20 bucks a year, whatever. They don't want to mess with it. Maybe they thought that was what was affecting their numbers. I, I'm a big believer once you give away things for free, it completely loses its value. Uh, I think that it's okay to charge a little bit to be a part of the USTA. Take all that money, though, and tell people what it's going for. It's like, yeah – uh, your membership for the year is 20 bucks, which is nothing nowadays. That's like 10 bucks, you know, however many years ago, a $20 bill, but $20 membership for the year for a junior player, take that money and say, we're going to use that money. They're supposed to be a non-for-profit organization and then allow clubs, allow clubs to, uh, you're shaking your head, allow clubs to apply and then go across the United States and say, in every state this year, we are going to find the right clubs to uh, that we're going to come in and put four to six clay courts in. And in turn, they sign a contract guaranteeing that they must run a certain amount of clay court events over the next, I don't know, five years. There's a way to do it that you know it's going to pay it for because, yeah, they're, they're using that money to build those courts. But if you turn around, they run so many events, they're getting some of that money back. They're getting more people playing. Tennis is more fun. People are getting excited about the new courts, the new facilities. Yeah. I think that when you pay it forward, it, that, it, that's going to find you back. You get people excited, they that energy is going to find you back. They got, nice, they got a lot of nice clay courts in Lake Nona for everybody that's down there playing. But it's a pretty exclusive and it's included uh, experience down there. But no, that's, I grew up on green clay. I, I, the reason I got into tennis was playing at, my dad was a former college player um, and got me in just playing on our, at our swim club on the green clay. And like, we had a great group, like 30, 40 kids. We had like power rankings. And that to me was like the driver. It was like, we had our coach putting up power rankings. Like you have to beat this guy to jump him in the rankings. We had, there was a men's side and a women's side and you're playing matches to, to be in your report and your scores. And it was just like, no one made us do it. It was just like we wanted to be at the top of the leaderboard, and it was just like a grind the whole summer to see when you were 12, could you beat the 16-year-old kids? And it was that was made it fun for me. But, I mean, uh, on that play, I mean, learning how to slide at a young age for me, I think that was a big part of why I was able to de like develop. I think a lot of us – we had so many college players play at this swim club, probably five or six in my age group that all went to play college. And I think just we were comfortable – Playing those long, like I think that really mattered when we were from ages seven to twelve, playing on clay, knowing how to construct a point, knowing how to slide, and um, now you see how important sliding is on the hard court too. So these kids and these juniors nowadays are all pretty adept to doing it. So it's cool. Nate, kind of pivoting here uh, to something just a little bit different. If you could go back in time and, and give advice to your thirteen-year-old self, what would that be? Oh. That's, a, that's I don't know if I've ever been asked that before. My 13-year-old self, um, what advice would I give to him? I would – that's a tough one. I would um, – no, I think, like, for me, I was always okay picking my own lane and, like, kind of going against the grain a little bit. But I would have said, like, I was never one that wanted to give up my whole weekends and do the traveling circuit thing. Um, and now I get to see these kids doing it and being, like – that how connected these juniors are that travel from their regions. And when they go off to play at different colleges, they still stay in touch. And 
I think that's super cool. Is like I was I, I kind of stayed. I was for me playing tennis was like none of my friends played. Like I had to like you, you know you kind of had like your your friends from school, and then you had like your tennis friends. And I was right. definitely like at my school. Like I went to an all boy high school too, uh, and tennis was not like it was football and basketball and baseball. It was like it was not kind of like the sport. But we ended up having a lot of three of us when the ended up playing college tennis. And I think we kind of stuck together. Um, but I would have liked to if I would have pushed myself a little bit more on the circuit to just travel and kind of make those connections. Cause you see it now, it's like, it's really cool. You go, when these guys go to like different junior nationals or whatever it's, and they, they meet all these kids up again. It's like, these guys are homies for life now. So I think that would be my, I think that I'd kind of go back and uh, maybe do a, a little, little retake. I think that is an underrated piece of advice. I've not heard that from someone yet, but obviously you had a unique experience of not really building those relationships with people outside of your own kind of tennis community. Um, but also I would add on to that young people, how you carry yourself matters. When you go to these tournaments, treat people with respect, shake people's hands, get to know people, because guess what? You don't know someday who you might want to reach out to for a job opportunity. Wow. I really like what that guy over there is doing. You know, I should ask him about it. Oh, you made friends with that person, even casually, they might let you know, Hey, you know, there's an opening. You should apply whatever it might be. In life, opportunities happen through networking, through building relationships, through talking to people and through carrying yourself the right way. So not just those friendships, but it's beyond that because it's it's going to pay for it's going to pay off in the long run in one way or another. Not every person that you introduce yourself is going to be your, your lifelong friend, but if they become a positive, casual acquaintance, you never know what that might lead to. Tennis tennis world is a small world. And it, and it's it so small. I, I just, yeah, no, it's, that's, that's a great um, addition to what I said. I think that just makes, that's what it is. It's like the tennis world is so connected, so small. It's insane how many times I've gone around the like three or four years after I, feel like I've lost the connection. The guy comes back in and he's still in tennis some way and reaches out to me with a kid that's looking for a scholarship and asking me to reach or like whatever it is. It's just like, uh, or I need a court to do a, some content on. And this guy knows this guy that plays there. It's just like, I think that's a good piece of advice for these kids is it, the tennis world in spe like specifically is so small. Everybody knows everybody. And uh, if you stay in the game long enough, you'll be, you'll be, see, you'll be seeing each other again. I, it's kind of funny. It's like everyone, adults at least young people may not realize this but there's this thing out there that exists called seven steps from kevin bacon because kevin bacon was in so many movies and in so many things that it, you could pick any person in the world and they know someone who knows someone that within seven steps you get to kevin bacon let's be That's honest right. in the tennis world everyone is less steps than that from roger federer or from an all-time great you know a coach or your coach knows a coach that knows someone that is their player has been a practice partner for him or that they, I mean, you can, the tennis world is so small and networking is such a big piece and how you treat people and what your work ethic is. People talk and, and, and you can create a lot of opportunities for yourself just by talking to people and being respectful and being nice. So yeah, no, a hundred percent, your piece of advice is great, but even expanding on it, it's all about how you carry yourself. Don't be afraid to talk to people. They're there too, just on the weekend. Like you might be like, ah, oh, no, nah, whatever, introvert. It's like, dude, make some friends. It's it's yep. it's good for you. So anyway, uh, do you have any tennis hot takes? I gotta know. Is there something that's a pet peeve? Something that drives you crazy? What it? What is? What is? What gets you fired up? I would say that my biggest. This is one I just talked about on our podcast. I think it as a joke, but it's like when I'm watching the tour match. And I was always cognizant of it when I was playing. Like when you get done playing a singles match and you're wearing a, a sweaty ball cap for like three hours and you like move your hand through your hair and then you go dap up your voice and good match. I'm just like, did you have to rub your sweaty head ball, like your sweaty head with your bare hand and then shake my hand and then shake the ump's hand? I'm just like, that kills me. That's just like, I don't know if these dudes even think about that, but I'm like, I don't even feel like that's like a germaphobe take. I think that's just like it's not. I, I'm it's, like that's just like disgusting. I'm like, what are we common? Doing? It's a common courtesy take. I'm just like I'm hurt. I, I can't believe how many people do it. Especially it's it's the guys that do it. And I don't see girls doing it. But it's like how many dudes have either a headband or a hat and they just wipe their they just wipe their head off and then they just slap the dude's hand. I'm like, that's that can't be that can't be good. <laughs> I I think it's underrated how many people are okay with just like 
walking around sweaty all day after that first match. I'm like, if I'm going to a tournament and I'm planning to win and I know I got to win five matches to win the tournament, I'm showing up with six or seven outfits worth of clothes because you feel like a new person when you change socks. You feel like a new person when you get your, if you put on a new shirt, but your shorts and like even your compression shorts are still drenched, change your clothes. You do not have to walk around gross all day. It's, it's like, hello, pack some extra socks. It's, it's not that complicated of a thought process. You'll probably play better because you don't feel gross. I don't know. I don't know. That's, I like to take yeah. that's that's so true. Some of these guys walk around the, the the facility like in the same attire four months later. I'm like, damn, dude, you can see the white dry sweat stains on their clothes and their hat. I'm like, I, I, that's funny. If I if I have the opportunity to like at least rinse off towel change between matches, hundred yeah. percent every time I'm gonna rinse off because I'm like I don't want to feel gross all day. This, I will play better if I'm not gross. I don't. The care. sock change is also major key. That is that's if nothing else. Yeah. Take extra socks and and I I travel in my like I have like eight hats, probably ten to twelve wristbands, uh, four towels, and enough socks to get through the day. That's the bare minimum. Got to get you a team yellow towel. That's it. That's what needs to happen. <laughs> All right, Nate. The next question I got for you here is: Could you? Uh, could you tell me what your happiest tennis moment is? Oh, I would say that's a tough one. Um, I feel like a lot of my favorite moments, it's t- I don't know if I, it's a playing moment or if it's a career, like a more of like my work career moment. I would have to say, so before I even started with um, Tennis Point, I was like working in basketball media. Uh, this is like 2018 like a year after school, I was working in going to some basketball on the side and selling alcohol. And I was like, I just like missed tennis. I was like, it had been like maybe like six months of me, like just only watching, really not playing much tennis. And I was like, I just had like this thing. I was like, I, I, I need to get back to tennis, like somehow, some way. And uh, during the Western and Southern, I just, I just applied for credentials through the basketball media outlet that I was working for 24 seven sports. And somehow got credentials and I was like, and we didn't even, ha- we didn't even cover tennis at all. Um, got credentials and started just conduct, like kind of figuring out like basically a lot of what I'm doing today is like the, the social media aspect. Uh, so I started an Instagram and started a Twitter and, you know, I interviewed Yoshi Nishioka when he had this phenomenal run to the, I believe it was the quarters before he had food poisoning, took out Kenny Shikori, uh, got to interview him and just gained like a huge following from Japan and on the last day, or like one of the last days I was going to be, because um, I think I was there for the first week, I had Roger Federer had like a, a round table and I didn't have like the courage. Like I had like interviewed a bunch of like the guys that were not obviously the, t- the big three. But then when it got to him, I was like, I was, I, I got tight. I got nervous. Like I just like didn't pull the trigger. And I was like, man, like I might not ever have a, a chance to interview Roger Federer again or get a question. And, well, then before his match with Rublev, he ended up taking a, uh, he ended up taking a, another um interview like a, with like the whole media session there and they were only gonna take eight questions and i was like I, the guy said like all right who's got questions or whatever and seven hands went up like immediately and i had no question in my mind but i was like i gotta raise my hand like and i raised my hand i swear those first seven questions went by like in two seconds and i didn't even realize it was like and all of a sudden Fed, like he looks at Federer looks at me and everybody's like, you know, I'm John Smith and with the New York times or I'm, Ro- I'm Robbie Johnson and I'm whatever. And they're like announcing themselves. And they, they looked at me and I was just like, I couldn't even say my name. I could barely even get words out. Like when Federer walked in the room, like there's a lot of grown adults in there and everybody just watched every step he took into this place. So like, I knew it wasn't only me that kind of like, kind of felt him. Like he just has yeah. like a different aura around him. And I'm a Rafa, like I'm a diehard Rafa guy. So like, he was never like, and I think I just wanted to like, whatever, not like kind of go against the grain. And I was like, but like he just had like this aura. And he looked at me and I was like, I, I couldn't even, I was like, uh, uh, and I was like, how do the speed of these courts compare to Wimbledon? And that's all I could think of. And like, he gave me this crazy, like two minute answer, which was like one of the coolest things in my life. And I was like, 
Damn, he actually like took that question in and gave an incredibly detailed answer. So I thought that was super cool. And like after that, I was like, I got to figure out how to work in tennis. And that's that was kind of like yeah. my, uh, my, my the story for me that kind of got me got the ball rolling. I'll say. Well, what I will say is a lesson that I learned a long time ago: never be afraid to ask questions, never be afraid to seek opportunities, because the worst thing that anybody can ever tell you is no. And yep. once you've heard no enough times, it's not painful anymore. You get over it. You, you really, you have to take chances in life and you'll be amazed how often people tell you yes. And, and that obviously is a story of how it worked out. You applied for credentials. You know, there's no reason in the world at that point, you know, for I mean, that to no. work out. And it does. I have no business being in there. At that time. Were you blown away whenever you got the yes? Oh, I was shook. And like, I had my own office space. I mean, I've, I've worked in tennis for the four years after that. And I haven't been credentialed at the Western and Southern since, but they're like, you know, it's hard. Like it was, I feel like it's not easy to get those. Right. And I was like, I was like shocked that I got them. And I was even more like, I had no idea what I was doing in there. But then I saw this kid, <laughs> this kid named Max Gal. It's just, it's just a small tangent, but he's, he was like 17 years old. He does, he does work with a bunch of, uh, he does a bunch of cool stuff now, but Max Gal, he's like 17 years old. I was like 23. I'm like, if this 17 year old can ask, <laughs> Serena and Naomi was talking questions then I can do it. I was like he then I can do it so um no it was cool to see a kid like that his age take a chance on himself and travel and down to these events and I was like all right I can I can do this so that was it was a it was a hell of an experience for me and it was uh one, one of the reasons that I feel like I've been able to kind of get on this journey Nate, here at the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, we're big believers in uh, giving people their flowers. Who's someone that's underappreciated in the tennis community? Oh, damn, man. You got, it's got a solid lineup of questions. I, these are all new questions for me. That's, you know, um, that's our goal is to have conversations that don't expire. I listen to too much tennis content. People weren't asking the questions I want to hear, Nate. Now we're here. That's, that is a good one. Who doesn't get their flowers in tennis? I would say someone on like the a more of like a global scale, you mean? It doesn't have to be. It can be it could be a community leader, it could be a coach, uh, it could be uh, any a, a tournament director, it could be a volunteer, it can be anything. Who's someone I, that's passionate about the game or giving to the game that just doesn't get, you know, doesn't always get to hear they're appreciated? I'm gonna say Angela Wilson. I got a shout out, Angela Wilson, who is the She's done everything in tennis. Uh, her and her sister played at the, at, at the professional. Her sister Andrew played in Indiana, or sorry, Indiana, and uh, I think they both played Indiana actually. But she was she won the Cincinnati Met, which was used to be a qualifier into the Western and Southern, um, and now is a club owner where I grew up. Um, runs the Greater Cincinnati Tennis Association as well. Does a bunch of other stuff for the USTA. Runs probably, in my opinion, the best tournaments in that I've like one of the best tournament directors when it comes to junior events as far as just her ability to communicate, organize, stay on schedule, um, get these kids excited and make sure everybody's having a good time. And I think what she does for <clears throat> what she does for tennis on a day in and day out basis has always been um something I've looked up to as a as a role model. Um and just someone I've tried to emulate as best as I can, just kind of bring in bring in the juice every day and trying to make this game fun for everybody and inclusive. And she's another person that's one of the main reasons why I've you know, future and like wanting to be involved in tennis. And I just, she just invited me on to be on one of these boards that I couldn't say no to. And what being able to watch her kind of conduct herself and how she kind of wants to strategize uh, how we can make tennis bigger and better in the city uh, is something I've always looked up to her. And I think that's uh, someone that definitely needs a shout out because she puts the work in and it's not easy um, to bring the juice on the court, off the court. She's when you're a business owner and a coach at that level, she used to coach the Bearcats uh yeah she just she, she can do it all and i think she's a, brought a community together in the midwest region um unlike anybody else last question nate who do you think needs to come on the grassroots tennis podcast keep in mind whoever you say you have to help us get them on the pod you're the one with the connections not me i am merely someone <laughs> you know along for the ride uh, you know, I've been trying to get people to give me two names. I've been encouraging maybe a player, someone that it could be professional or at any level to a college player at any level to even a junior player who you just know is passionate about the game. And then I'm like a coach or a community leader of some kind who has a tennis brain that just needs to be picked 
or uh, has a story that we just have to hear? Oh, man. Um, I think for me, it's going to be Greg Boyton, the coach of Phoebe Hercotch, former coach of, I believe, Isner and Courier. Um, Greg Boyton has to be high on that list for me. Uh, he's also a Cincinnati native um, as well. Uh, he just, I, every time I talk to him about QB's game or just what he's learned coaching at that level and just kind of ebbs and flows of uh, just the men, just the mentality of these top players. And um, I think that's a guy that just, he's so, he's just relatable and down to earth, but has so much knowledge about the game. And I think he's as good of a mental coach as he is like a tactician type coach. And I think he's a, uh, a guy that you need to get on. He's, he's the man, Craig Boyden, man. I think that would be a great one. We would love to do that. Brad Stein and... would be another one, maybe. Okay. Well, you're the one that's got the contacts on me. You're going to have to help me uh, figure that one out. But those those are both great names and obviously people we would love to talk to. Nate, I could talk to a brick wall for an hour, but I don't want to use up all your time. We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you so much. And then for all of you out there who are listening to the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, uh, if you like what we're doing here at the Grassroots Tennis Podcast, make sure the, the best way to help us continue to grow is to subscribe on YouTube and Spotify and, and make sure and share this podcast with someone you know loves tennis. The only way the game grows is if we keep talking about it and we keep figuring out how to make it a better thing for everyone. Then uh, if you want to give us a follow on socials, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, we are currently doing follow for follow. Yes, if you follow us, we don't care who you are. We will follow you back. We are all friends here. If you're a friend of the pod, we want to follow you too. On Instagram and TikTok, you can find us at Grassroots Tennis Pod. And on Twitter, it's at G Tennis Pod because Twitter told us that that was way too long of a handle and it was really annoying and it's driving me crazy, but that's what it is. Uh, and if you've got any follow-up questions uh, or maybe you want a mailbag, if you have questions for Nate, you can. we would love to hear your questions. Or maybe you have a question that I've not been asking these interviews that you want to hear from people. Or maybe you know someone who should be on the Grassroots Tennis Podcast. You can email us at grassrootstennispod at gmail.com. Nate, my friend, thank you so much. My oh, man, Ship, I appreciate you having me on. That was a ton of fun. I will have to run a uh, – you'll have to come on the Pure Tennis Podcast one day. We're – we're getting getting set up so we can have video. I know that's what I feel like I need to do to take this another step further. I need to get the social clips out there so we can when you call your shots on the Pure Tennis Podcast, we got to have it clipped up so we can we can we can run the tapes back. But hey, man, hey, I, tell everybody really quick where they can find all your content for the Pure Tennis Podcast. I meant to ask you that. Can you can you give people where they can find it? Yeah, guys. So at Pure Tennis Podcast is our Instagram handle, um, as well as that's the name of our podcast. It's on iTunes. Uh, Apple Music, or and then it's on Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher. I think it's pretty much everywhere. Um, working on getting it on YouTube as a video in video format. Uh, but yeah, we've we were trying to uh, pump out as much as many episodes as we can. Trying to do the same thing. Ships got going on here. Get some guests on here as well. But uh, yeah, ton of fun with it. I just we just uh, I think we're at two years now. Over just like 60, 70 episodes somewhere in there. So it's it's been a learning experience and it's been a lot of fun and. Uh, one of the things that I'm probably most proud of that uh, that I get to work on. I love your pod, but what I'm going to tell you is with the people I have scheduled, I'm going to have 50 episodes within three months of starting by the end of July. You got to step up, man. We need more content. Put the pressure on get, me. I, I love I'm going to catch you. I'm going to catch you, man. I'm competitive. Mm -hmm. We're going to we're going to we're going to have more episodes than you by the end of summer, maybe. I don't know. We'll, this, we'll, we'll, we'll put a little wager on that. We'll I put a little know. wager on that. <laughs> we'll I, talk. I, we'll I'm talk just, after. I'm learning to do the, some of the audio engineering stuff here this week. I got a little sit down classroom work with my man JP. So I'm hoping that uh, even when somebody's out of town, I can, I can run up a show. Guys, make sure and go out there and listen to the Pure Tennis Podcast. Give these people a follow. Give them a share. And that's more important than even following and sharing our podcast. We got to grow the game. All these people, we got to grow the media so people that are passionate are actually sharing and growing the game. Uh, you got to listen to the Pure Tennis Podcast. You got to hear about those sticky situations that they got <laughs> over there on the Pure Tennis Podcast. I, I always listen to their, to their content and I laugh. There's a lot of great people in tennis media and Nate, you are definitely one of those people. People, thank you so much for coming on. Much love, my man. I appreciate it. Happy Monday. Absolutely.
Take care. Yes, sir.